Good morning. morning. Hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas. Boy, we have got a great morning here this morning. It's already been a good morning in Sunday school, uh, but we have got even greater things to come. We get to celebrate both, both of the ordinances of our church this morning, that in baptism as well as in the Lord's Supper later on. So we're very excited about what God's doing here. And uh, this morning we're going to open up our service with prayer before we begin with our baptismal service. Would you pray with me? Father God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you call us. God, we don't call you. You call us. And Father, you give us the opportunity to call out to you. So, Father God, this morning we thank you, Lord, for the grace that you show us, Father, in desiring to have a relationship with us. God, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to enter into a relationship with you and to follow you in obedience. And God, this morning that's exactly what we celebrate in the baptism of these two young men. Lord God, we thank you, Father, for their faith, for their salvation, and Father, for this, their step of obedience as one of many steps of obedience that will follow in their life. Lord God, we thank you for this church. We thank you for all that you're doing in our midst, and God, the work you still have yet to do. So, Father, we submit ourselves to you, and we honor and worship you at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We talk about all the time that baptism is not the means of being saved. It's simply a sign of being saved. It's a step of obedience after one has already put faith in Jesus Christ and already continued to to, to start to learn in him and to walk in him and to grow in him. And this morning, we couldn't be more excited than to have two of our young guys, two of our elementary school students, to come and to follow the Lord in obedience and baptism this morning. This morning, our first to come is Cooper Neely. So the other day, we had talked to Levi, who's going to come in just a minute, uh, uh, a few days before he came forward on Sunday morning and uh, made his profession of faith public. And uh, I mean, no sooner than we got to say amen praying with Levi, I look up and Cooper is right here, right? He, is, he was ready, and I think it was a little bit of a surprise. I know it was a surprise to me because I opened my eyes and there was Cooper. And, uh, but he, was, he said, look, I'm ready too. I'm ready too. And I asked him, I said, have you, have you prayed and given your life to Christ? And he said, yeah. I said, well, man, let's talk a little bit. We did. And so here he is. Saved your brother in Christ and showing his obedience and walking out his obedience through being baptized. Cooper, have you given your life to Christ and have you promised to follow him wherever he may lead? It's my great pleasure to baptize you, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Next, we have Levi Westmoreland. Several weeks ago, Levi said, hey, I got some questions. I want to talk to you about it. And I'm going to tell you what, he, I don't know if he had more questions or if I had more questions because he was pretty sure of what God had already done in his life. And so when Levi walked down, really just took a few steps from the front pew that morning, we knew what he was coming for. And, uh, and he had already been saved, and he is now, again, just like Cooper, and maybe even, I don't know, God may have even used you to inspire Cooper a little bit to do it that morning. And that's what, that's what church is all about, isn't it? Uh, but he's ready to follow God, follow Christ in baptism this morning. Levi, have you given your life to Christ and have you committed your life to follow him wherever he's going to lead you? Then it's my pleasure to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Folks, I would invite you, if there's not been a moment in your life, first off, that you've given your life to Christ, that's what we're here to talk about today. He, is, he has been born, we celebrated that just here at Christmas, but he also died, and we celebrate that every day. He died for your sin and for my sin, that you might find forgiveness from that sin that you couldn't attain on your own through him. And so this morning, if you've not put your faith in Christ, I would invite you to do like these two young men, and to put your full faith, your full trust, your whole life, into trust in Jesus Christ. And once you do that, and if you have done that, but you've not yet followed through in baptism, I would encourage you to come. Just let's talk about it. We won't make you do anything. Uh, and you see, we don't hold you under very long either, so it's really easy. But it's really important. It's a symbol of what God has done on the inside that we get to show on the outside to folks like, like our church family, and then also to live it out throughout the world. 
We love you this morning. We look forward to worshiping with you as we continue to go on. As we do continue our service this morning, uh, already had a great opening uh, to the worship service, but we're going to do our call to worship. We'll stand. Hymn number 359. This is the day. Y'all stay home with your family, have fun with them. Uh, I know some of you may have fireworks and all sorts of stuff planned, so y'all y'all have fun with that, but be safe. Uh, we will continue our service uh, this morning uh, with hymn number 644, Count Your Blessings.
air. It takes a little while. Well, guys, I hope, I hope that you are ready for a new year. Are you ready for a new year? How many of you are ready for school to get back? Yeah? All right. That is awesome. Good job. Good job. That's the way to be. Uh, teachers, anybody ready for school to start back? Don't leave. It's really okay. We won't make you go back anytime soon. Well, look, it is a new year. I hope you had a great Christmas. I'm sure that you did. I saw lots of pictures and all kinds of stuff, reports about what you guys got for Christmas and what you did with your families and all that. That's awesome. But you know, as soon as Christmas is, you know, as soon as December 25th comes and goes, man, the new year is right on it, right? And it's just about to get started. In fact, this Wednesday will be the last day of 2019. Do you believe that? And that means Excuse me, this Tuesday. This Wednesday will be the first day of 2020. Valerie only knows that because it's her birthday, by the way. Uh, but I appreciate her reminding me. <laughs> so, but yeah, and so a brand new year and a brand new decade. And man, 2020. Now you guys, that uh, probably doesn't mean as much to you, but there's some folks sitting out there that used to think 2020 was a long way off. you believe that? I know you guys do. And I know I do too. 2020, man, 2020. But you know what? With a new year, there's all kinds of new possibilities. There's all kinds of new things that we might get to see, that we might get to do. And all of it will happen as God has planned for us. And so this morning, I want to to just encourage you guys, as you get ready this week to enter into this new year, new decade, the decade where where you guys will do things like go to middle school and go to high school. Some of you even go to college. Who knows, some of you by 2030 might even be married, you know? Wow, that could be crazy, huh? But that's a long time. But in this new decade, this new year to come, I want you to think about what is it that you think that God wants to do in your life in this next year? Because guess what? He wants to do something that only he can do. And sure, you'll get to go some places, you'll get to do some things, but he's got some things that he wants to teach you. He's got some things that he's going to let you grow in and help you grow in. He's got some ways that you're going to get to serve him, and it's going to be awesome. Let's pray together this morning. Lord God, we love you, and we thank you that your mercies are fresh every morning. They're new, Father. They are are given out to us yet again. God, we thank you for your mercy. I thank you for these guys, these girls. I thank you for for Cooper and Levi who, who followed through in baptism this morning from their salvation. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan for each of us in this coming year, this coming decade. So, Lord God, would you help us? to give our lives to, to you, to follow and to find those things that you have for us. And once you show us, God, help us to run with all we have towards you in these days, weeks, months, years, and even decades to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue our service this morning, uh, our favorite hymn, Jacob Bowen's favorite hymn, When We All Get to Heaven, hymn number 514.
for your family, so thankful for Levi's family, for all of your families that, uh, that serve our church so well. And I'll tell you, we, uh, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a fast seven months. That's, uh, that's how long we've been back with you guys, and, and it it's, it's doesn't seem like it's been that long. Uh, in some ways, you know, waiting on the sign to get worked, it doesn't seem like it was that long and ten years longer, but anyway. Uh, but it, it doesn't seem like it's been seven months that we've been uh, just having the, priv- the privilege and the pleasure of getting up and sharing God's word with you, uh, serving with you side by side in our community, and of getting to just get to, get to know some of you more than we already did and get to know some of you just for, for the first time. And, uh, and so this, this week is we have just a, a single message, not part of a series, uh, but just a single message as we think about moving forward into this new year as God brings it to us. Uh, we, we also want to look back. And, and I think that as you see on the screen there, the title of the message is Backward to Forward, and I think that it's very important that if we ever want to move forward well, that we have to be able to look backward honestly. We have to look back at what has been so that we can know where we are and therefore understand where we might could go, where, my, where we might be led to go by the Lord himself. And that's the idea this morning. Now, uh, I'm going to bring you a New Year's gift. This is going to be a shorter message. I thought y'all would be more excited about that. It's okay. We'll go back to hour long. With, uh, we haven't done that yet. But 40 minutes for sure. And, uh, but it'll be a short message because we'll be re- getting ready to, do, uh, to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper together at the end of our service, and so we're excited about that. Uh, but as we get ready to do what we call the Lord's Supper, that ordinance of the church that Christ has commanded us to do to remember Him, it's a perfect time for us to think about what has been in our life and what indeed is in our life right now. And to think about, as we take of the Lord's Supper, to think about what is to come, what is the future, 
As long as we're still breathing, God has got things for us to do and things for us to learn and things for us to see and things for us to be a part of in serving and honoring Him. And, and, and we have to always, if we're going to do all those things well, we have to always know where we're coming from. We have to know who we are in the moment. We can't be deceived. We can't be deluded and think that we are something other than what we are. We have to own who we are. And better yet, let the Lord own who we are so He can make us who He wants us to be. And, and make no mistake this morning that God is always in the process of making us who He wants us to be. You may be sitting out there and say, well, I've been a Christian twice as long as you've been alive, preacher. And, and maybe you have, and praise God for that. But He's still not done with you. You may be like these guys who just in the recent weeks have given their life to Christ. And He's still working on them too. He is always, as long as we're drawing breath, this side of Christ's return or our passing away into his eternity, we, he, we will have work to be done on us and in us and through us. And so as we think about this coming year, it's part of that process. We don't ever need to fall into the trap of thinking that we are who we are and that's where we need to stay and that's it. Now there are things, our faith, if we have put our faith in Christ, we need to keep our faith in Christ, but it needs to grow. If we serve right now, then we need to keep on serving according to the Lord's leading. Uh, and we need to see where He would have us to serve in new and other ways as He brings them to us. But we need to make sure that we are continuing to grow. Just because we become a teacher uh, of Sunday school or a Bible study or become a pastor, it doesn't mean that He's finished growing us. It doesn't mean that He's finished working on us. It doesn't mean that He doesn't have future plans to move in us. And just because we've known Him for a while and we've seen a lot of things that He's done, and that other people have done, and that we've done, and we think we've got it all figured out, then we don't need to stop growing then, either. He's always got something for us to do. We're going to share this thought this morning through a, 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 probably a familiar story to you. It's one that gets preached and taught a lot. You've probably heard it over the years if you've been in Sunday school for a while. You've probably heard a few different angles on it. But as we look at it this morning, in the Gospel of John chapter 8, we're going to look at it from this idea of backward to forward. So if you would, stand with me as we read God's Word together. John chapter 8, and we'll begin in verse 2. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them, of course him being Jesus. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Please be seated. Lord God, would you speak through your word now? Father, hide me behind your cross. And Father, speak through our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The religious leaders of the time were always offended at what Jesus said, mostly because it took away their authority. It took away their fame. It took away their stature. It took away their place in the society. And it took away their power. And so they were constantly trying to figure out a way, based on what he was saying, to trap him. And this is another one of those instances. We're not going to spend as much time thinking about that part of it, though, other than how it pertains to this idea of things that have happened and of where we're going to go from here. Now, first off this morning, I think we can all understand, and you can see it there in your bulletin there, the blank is 2019 blank. Well, be careful how you fill that in, right? It might be 2019 ruled. It might be 2019 stunk. You might have stronger language in either direction you might want to use for 2019. But for our sake this morning... 2019 happened. It happened. It's, it's almost done. We've just got a couple more days that are considered 2019. The year started, the year progressed, and the year will end unless Christ comes back before them. But 2019 happened. 
The things that have happened during 2019 to us, the things that we've done, the things that have been done around us or to us or in our name or whatever, they've been done. They, they, it's, it's happened. It's, 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 it's fact. It's, it's actual occurrence. It's history now. There's no changing that. There's no way to go back and, and say that it didn't happen. We can deny it all we want, but if it happened, it happened. Our past, not just 2019, but everything in our past has happened. Our attitudes have been our attitudes. Our actions have been our actions. Things we've said have been the things we've said. And the same thing is true in the things that didn't happen. The things that didn't happen didn't happen. The things, the attitudes that we didn't take, well, they didn't happen. The attitudes, or excuse me, the, the, the actions that we didn't commit, they didn't happen. And the things we didn't say didn't get said, at least not by us. This is the same case with this woman who was caught in adultery. At no point in this story do we get the idea that maybe she wasn't caught in adultery. At no point do we get the idea that these people, even though we do have a direct, a direct word that tells us that they're trying to trap Jesus, it's not that they set this up. Now, could they have? Sure. But what we find out later on at the end of the passage is, is that no, this woman was caught in adultery. The adultery happened. She was unfaithful. This woman was not an innocent when it came to what she was accused of. She was guilty of what, she had, what they said she had done. The question was not about her guilt. It was now about what would they do. And I would encourage you to understand that it's not about your guilt of things that you didn't do that you should have in the past, or things that you did do that you shouldn't have done, or things that you didn't know that maybe you should have taken time to learn. It's not about your guilt in that, or my guilt in that, but it's about what is going to be done with us now. You see, with each new day, as the Scripture tells us, God's mercies are new, they're fresh every morning. You ever wonder why things go the way they go? You ever wonder why the sun rises much the way, or much opposite of the way it sets? You ever, you ever wonder why God built into creation all of this cyclical nature, this, these cycles that go on? You ever wonder why January is usually starts off kind of cold? This one we're hoping will eventually, right? You, you ever wonder why God has these patterns? It's because he is constantly introducing to us freshness and newness. He is constantly introducing to us opportunity to say basically what are you going to do now now what because the past as it happens it, it, it becomes the past immediately once something happens it now becomes our past now, i won't i won't do a bunch of mental gymnastics with you this morning to talk about present and past and when present becomes past and then was future and all that we won't do all that because that'll just make your eyes cross this morning but it might keep you awake <laughs> but it'll make your eyes cross but this morning once we've done something, it's in the past. Now, some of those things, it's in the past, and we can be excited about it, but we can't dwell too much on our excitement for it because it's in the past. Some good things happen that go into the past, but certainly also some things that we're not proud of happen in the past. And once they're done, they become the past. And they've happened. The question then becomes not, oh, but what has been done? It becomes what will be done. And you know what? Only the Lord knows what 2020 will bring. Only the Lord knows what 2020 will bring. He knows all of it. We know maybe at best a little bit of it. We assume that our taxes will be due. We assume that work will start back up again. We assume that school will start back up again. We, we assume some things. We've got plans to take trips and plans to do things. I uh, heard this week that we've got plans for a new addition to our church family to come along, a new baby that's, that's been announced on Facebook, so I'm not, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. Uh, and, but we know some things, but we don't know what all it will hold. We don't know what school will be like when we get back there, students, teachers. We don't know what work will be, back, it'll be like when we get into it in 2020. We don't know what our church will be like. We don't know what our lives will be like exactly. Now, we can reasonably think about some things, but only the Lord knows. It's interesting that as Jesus is confronted with this situation where this woman has committed adultery and the question has been brought to him in the form of a, of a trapping question, uh, to, to, it, it's an interesting that he doesn't start to look at her. But he bends down, stoops down, and starts to draw on the sand. And there's all kinds of, of hypotheses about what he 
wrote when he, when he was drawing in the sand. Could have been nothing, could have been everything. He could have written there for a long time, he could have written there just momentarily. Some have said that he started to write out the names of the people that were involved in this plot to traffic. Some of the people have said that he actually writes down the plot. Whatever he wrote, he knew, he knew what was about to happen. He knew the teaching opportunity he was about to give both to these men who were accusing this woman, but also this woman who had had this past. And so he writes there and he stands back up and he says, I'll tell you what, any of you who have not sinned, why don't you start us off? You want to condemn this woman. You want to literally bring her life to a close because of her sin. Well, let's talk about sin in general. And he says, whoever is without sin, whichever one of you has not sinned at all, please be the first one to cast a stone. Be the first one to throw a stone at this woman. Well, now the people are, are absolutely stuck. Because much like they were trying to trap him, they are now trapped by who they are in the moment and just by honesty. Because for them at that point to pick up a stone and to throw it at this woman would have been to proclaim their perfection. And the people right around them would have probably eaten them alive. Think about it for just a second. Things happen in our lives. Things happen. We see them on the news. We see them on social media. We, see, we hear about them in our, in our talk and in our, in our community. And the minute we get too high and mighty about judging people, what starts to happen? People go, well, wait a minute. What about you? And you know what? They should. We should. We should never be so, so, so focused on one person's sin that we forget about our own. Because our sin, like 2019, has happened. So the people are stuck there. And I'll tell you, one of my favorite, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is John 8, verse 9. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. We get the idea that this is a long kind of process because there's a huge crowd waiting to see what's going to happen. Anytime someone was going to be stoned in the Jewish tradition, there'd be a crowd of people to do it. It wasn't just a couple. And one at a time, they start to walk away. One at a time, they start to, to realize, no, I have sinned too. They start to realize who they are. They start to understand that things have happened and their question is being answered, what are they going to do next? Because... The Lord has, has written whatever he's written on the ground. He's actually gone back down to writing again. And maybe at this point he's written out the individual sins next to the names that he wrote down. I don't know. It says that this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. And this is my favorite part, especially as I get year by year older. I start to understand it a little bit more. When I was young, I used to think, okay, it's because they were wrong more than anybody else. No, because the more life we live, the more things we have to be real about in our lives. The longer we live, the more we understand that we have no basis to judge. We have no basis because of our own lives to usurp the power of God in somebody else's life. It says the older ones first until only Jesus was there. Those of you who've lived a few years, you get this, don't you? If you're a teenager this morning, this may seem kind of like it did to me as a teenager. Like, yeah, adults don't know nothing. <laughs> you know, they're constantly saying, no, it's not that. We do grow hopefully wiser as we get older. We do start to understand our place in the world and the, how our actions affect things and what we do and, and how it goes. We do start to understand more of our imperfection and, and doubt more and, and have more reason to doubt our thoughts of our own perfection. The older ones first walk away. Their what next went from, from either trapping this man who claimed to be the Son of God, who eventually would prove himself to be such, or to taking part in taking the life of this wretched sinner woman who was caught in adultery. That was where they were heading. But at this point, based on Jesus speaking into their life and exposing some things just very simply but very powerfully in their life, they turn and walk away to look into themselves. When we take the Lord's Supper in just a few moments, I hope that you'll take time to look into yourself. I hope you'll take some time in introspection. 
that you would look into your life and say, honestly, between you and the Lord, where am I right now? Who am I? What am I about? What is my motivation? What's my purpose? What am I doing? I believe that that is one of the most powerful parts of the Lord's Supper as we partake of it. It's to have time where we're not doing a bunch of stuff. We're just sitting there holding a symbol of His flesh, a symbol of His blood, broken and spilled for us. And we're thinking about what we're doing and what we're not doing with that sacrifice that He made for us. These folks did that. But you know, they would not have shown up to the stoning. They would not have shown up to this possible and potential uh, execution of this woman under the Jewish law without something to do it with. And so we have reason to believe that these people would have been holding rocks in their hands. And not little pebbles, but rocks that they would throw after this woman would be pushed off of a, uh, of a hill several feet high, off of a little cliff there in the, in the city, pushed off, and if the fall didn't kill her, then traditionally they would throw those heavy rocks on her until she was dead. And they would do that to anybody. When you hear the Bible talking about someone being stoned, that's what it is. But as they walk away, one of the most powerful, reasonable things I can glean from this passage is that the rocks drop. One at a time, the older ones first, until there was no one around. Can you imagine the sound of heavy rocks dropping from hand level into sand? And that dull thud, the little shift of sand as it settled, that represented them realizing about themselves and putting something down that was not right and walking away to pick something up that was. This morning as we look backward to go forward, this morning as we look at 2019 to see where 2020 might lead us in the Lord, some things must be put down. We each and everyone, and together as a church, we've all got some things that need to drop and settle in the sand and be left behind. I'm not going to call them out. That's not my job. The Lord does that in each of our hearts. I know the things that I need to put down. You know the things that you need to put down. And much like the people standing there, if you say this morning, I don't have anything to put down, maybe pride would be the first thing you'd put down. Maybe self-delusion would be the first thing you put down. Because guess what, guys? We all have them. We all have it. There's something or some things, if it's like all of or most of us, most all of us, that need to be put down. Have you ever, I, I thought about this morning, you know, on baptism mornings, I've got, you know, my bag with the computer and, my, you know, my Bible and, and, and iPad and all that type of stuff in it that I bring every day. Uh, but then I've also got, uh, you know, uh, some hanger clothes that I'm going to change into after baptism. I've got some towels and, and I've got my, my other little bag that has, you know, some socks and underwear and stuff like that in it. I know you want to know that. Uh, and I've got all that stuff, and as I get out of the car, I feel like, you know, the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, I kind of get out, and I feel like I'm just, like, loaded up, I look like a pack animal walking in the church, some of you might have seen me come in this morning, uh, but I think about that, and there's always something else to pick up, well, this morning, it was a little warmer outside, and so I had, I had a handkerchief sitting on top of my stuff in the, in the car, and it fell right as I had all that stuff, and so I had to reach in and do that dance where I'm trying, I've got my hands full, and I'm trying to pick this thing up with my knuckles or my teeth or my elbow or whatever I can use, and, and it's hard, right? And I share that with you this morning because there's no way when we have our hands full of these things that aren't right to be able to put it, pick up the things that are right because we've only got so many hands. And this morning, if we want to, and as we want to, move forward as Christians, as we want to move forward as a church, as we want to move forward in serving our community and sharing the love of Christ here and everywhere, we can't pick up new ways to do that. We can't pick up new opportunities if our hands are full of the things that need to be let down and put down. This morning, I, uh, the invitation to you is this. If your hands are full of something that isn't godly, if your hands or your heart are full of things that dishonor the Lord, that would hinder you from doing what He calls you to do in this coming year, then the invitation is, hey, would you put them down? Why would you want to carry them to begin with? 
If this morning you're looking forward to seeing Harrisville be, Baptist Church become an even brighter light than we already have been in our community and in this world, would you be willing to put some things down? Would you be willing to take just a moment in our, in our time of invitation and say, God, what do I need to drop? What are those things in my life that I need to put down? What are those things, Lord, that are dishonoring you that I know about and that I've known about for a while? that I need to finally let go of? And God, what are the things that this morning, just this morning, you're showing me that might potentially be some of those things? But I'd ask you this morning, would you put them down? Would you let the past be the past? Because God has conquered the past. The past is not our master. Jesus Christ is our master if our faith is in Him. And so this morning, would you let Him take care of all that? Drop those things from the past. Drop those attitudes. Drop those thoughts. Drop those ways of doing things. Drop those words. Drop those things that you watch or you listen to or you chase after that would keep you from being in God's will for your life. Would you put those down? And this morning, could we as a group of individuals and collectively as a church together, could we pick up the things of God and only the things of God? You see, when the folks walked away, they had to walk somewhere. Many of them went home. Many of them went back to work. They went back to their regular life, but they went back different because they didn't have that stone that represented their judgment. They had empty hands that could grasp the grace of God. Did they get it perfect? Probably not. But were they changed in that moment? Absolutely. But it all started with putting that stone down. So this morning as we sing, in a time of invitation, what is it that you need to put down? Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you and we thank you, Father, that you are the God of putting things down so that we might pick things up in you. Lord God, we thank you, Father, for the year that has been 2019 and even for the, 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 the hard, terrible parts of it, the ones that hurt and the ones where we hurt others. Father, forgive us of those things and in your forgiveness, let us drop that and let us pick up you and you alone and all of the things that are you and that are from you and that are for you in this new year if you give it to us. Oh God, work in hearts. God, right now there's those out there, even as we pray, that are fighting, putting down things they need to put down. But Lord God, would today, December 29th, be the day they put them down and put them down for good under your power and in your grace. Lord, these things we put down and put on the altar for you right now, God, is part of our worship for you. Would you bring those that need to do that they need to come forward, let them come forward and let us talk. If they need to talk later privately, then Father, let that happen. If they need to simply do business with you right where they sit, then Father, you do business with them in your will and to their betterment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning would you come. Put those things down now. fifth Sunday of the month was the days that we set aside to celebrate during the course of the year the Lord's Supper. Of course what we do now is something that Jesus commanded back right before he was, was taken and arrested and then crucified and then rose from the grave. 
something that he sat around with his disciples and taught them how to do, remember what he had done. And so as we look into our own, our own hearts, into our own souls this morning, as God would continue to deal with us, I would invite you to take part of this Lord's Supper. Of course, there's nothing magical about it. It's just crackers and it's just juice. But it's the symbols powerful in our lives. This morning, this is for any of you who have put your faith in Christ. Traditionally in the church, we, we, we ask that if you've not yet done that, that you would take this time to think about who God is in your life. And that rather than, than take as if you have, that you might even this morning come and put your faith in Christ as He works in your heart. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for the sacrifice of Your Son. We thank You for this celebration, this remembrance, Father, of everything You have done. Lord God, we thank You for the broken body, the spilled blood, that bring us forgiveness and redemption. Lord God, would You bless this time, Father. Bless You with it. Help us to look into our own hearts and to take this time soberly, seriously, reverently, and in worship to You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus told us, as he told his disciples, take this bread, my broken body, that was broken for you. As we serve you this morning, would you take under Jesus' command? body broken for us Could you take now and on that same night after he had passed the bread around the table representing his broken body he talked to them about the cup and in the cup was wine or juice 
And he said, this is representative of my blood. Feel for you. It's that blood that atones for our sin. The body is broken for the sacrifice. The blood is spilt to atone. That is where our forgiveness is found. The debt is paid with the body. The blood covers us and washes us whiter than snow. This isn't blood we're drinking this morning. This great juice for this morning that represents the power of the blood of Christ. As you take the cup, do this in remembrance of me as you drink. Let's pray together. Lord God, we humbly, but Father, with excitement, celebrate the sacrifice you made for us. Lord God, we thank you for this year that has been 2019. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have, unless you choose to do differently, a year ahead of us with many opportunities, maybe even more than we've had. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together as a church family to celebrate baptism, the steps of obedience and the symbols of our salvation, and then this also time to celebrate your supper, or it celebrates the means to our salvation. Father God, as we've been reminded of these things, Lord God, would you work in us God, would you let those reminders strengthen us, encourage us, motivate us, guide us and direct us as we go. Lord God, this morning we thank you, Father, for that you have provided Jesus for us, and that he is our champion. God, we, uh, we think about right now Super Bowl coming up, and college football playoffs, and championship games, and all the things we enjoy. But God, we enjoy nothing more that when we know that we are on the side of the true champion, the champion above all champions, Jesus Christ. So, Lord God, let us live each day that you give us, knowing that we are in victory if our faith is in him, and knowing that we can be if we will but put our faith in him. 
So Lord God, as we dismiss with this last song, would you give us a great outlook going into 2020? Would you let us know that we are not just serving the champion, but we are in fact co-heirs with Jesus Christ, the champion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.